welcome everyone. I'm Joy, your host for 84,000 in Conversation, a web series where we ask scholars to speak to us on various topics that relate to the translations of Buddhist scriptures that can be found in 84,000's online reading room. The topic today is the Bodhisattva as the Ideal Practitioner, a conversation on a text called The Collected Teachings on the Bodhisattva, in Sanskrit, Bodhisattva Pitaka, and in Tibetan, Changchub Sembe Denu. In this conversation, we will discuss the text's extensive presentation of the qualities of an ideal Mahayana practitioner with scholar and translator, Professor Jens Brodvik. Before we begin, we'd like to remind everyone that Chinese interpretation is available for today's event. So please click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen to enter the Chinese interpretation room if you require it. I'll just give everyone a few seconds to shuffle to that room if needed. All right, today we are very happy to have with us Professor Jens Brorvik to share his insights on the collected teachings on the Bodhisattva, which he translated for 84,000. Jens Brorvik is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Cultural Studies and Oriental Languages at the University of Oslo. He specializes in the history, literature, and languages of Buddhism. He has dedicated many years to translating this text, which holds significant importance within the Ratnakuta collection. We will be taking questions from the audience at the end, so please do feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box that you'll find below. Now, let me bring Professor Brodvik in to start this 84,000 in conversation event. Hello, Professor Brodvik. It's so good to see you. Thank you for hello, being hello. here with us today. Hello. Hello, can you, you hear me all right? Yes, yes I can hear you. So. Great. Yes. So thank you so much for inviting me to this event. Uh, of course, um, uh, it was uh, some work to translate the Bodhisattva Pitaka, but uh, it's also a great honor to be part of the 84,000 project. I'm so amazed by what you have accomplished, and I really admire what you have done. And uh, this translation, of course, is uh, is uh, done uh, as a contribution to this enormous initiative, which is good for Buddhism, it's good for world culture, it's good for scholarship, it's good for a lot of things, I would like to say. Oh, thank you so much. But, you know, a project like 84,000 is only possible because of translators and scholars like yourself. So thank you so much. Um, I think I'm going to jump in with some questions for you regarding this text, and we can go from there. So, we're here today to talk specifically about a scripture called the Collected Teachings on the Bodhisattva in Sanskrit Bodhisattva Pitaka. Could you describe for us uh, the general contours of this text? What is it about and where in the Kangyur does it belong? Yes, so in the in the Tibetan Kangyur, it's uh, uh, integrated in the heap of jewels, the Ratnakuta, and uh, of course, uh, texts and Buddhist teachings are often uh, compared to jewels, and they, of course, they are jewels. Uh, and uh, so, but this Ratnakuta has a lot of various kinds of, of uh, sutras. It's a kind of miscellany, uh, in a sense. Uh, you have the Pranya Paramita collection, which is the Pranya Paramita, and uh, this huge literature. You have the Buddha Tangsaka, which is uh, a separate, uh, a separate uh, collection. Uh, then, also in Chinese, you have the Mahasanipata, the great collection or the great assembly but really the great collection of teachings. So though this is not part of the Tibetan collection as such, but many of the texts in the Mahasandipata are there. And of course, um, 
this collection of Buddhist and the Tibetan collection of Buddhist texts, when you look at it, it's kind of breathtaking, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. so huge. Oh, it's very, very maha. As maha, <laughs> maha is maha, you could say. Right. Uh, so, uh, so it's part of that. And then, of course, uh, you can historize this in a sense. And uh, as we do as historians. And then you could argue that of the Mahayana Sutras, uh, they were, as is the scholarly consensus, they were uh, well edited and systematized first. So this is historically the first. And uh, people don't agree uh, about when this was done. But uh, in recent years, of course, the date has been put a bit back. So around the beginning of the Christian era, even a bit before, but it's hard oh. to say because these are oral teachings being codified and assembled, assembled into texts. So you can put the Bodhisattva Pitaka into such a historical setting. And then uh, it's not certain, but according to my view, uh, of course, Pranayaparamita is the first. And then I, I think that probably uh, Bodhisattva Pitaka is fairly early, maybe mm. first century. Mm. And after that, or you could put the Mahasanipata. Mm. And then even after that, uh, there are a lot of sutras which are yeah, kind of um, critical and kind of critical of the monastic institutions like the Vimalakirti and all the sutras connected with the Vimalakirti. Well, they make a bit fun of the monastic community, in fact. But so you could date this, the view, date the sutras maybe according this uh, timeline that, of course, the Pranyaparamita, uh, all the Shariputra, Ananda, all are there as bodhisattvas. And then you have the Bodhisattva Pitaka, uh, who, uh, which is about a layman. It's about, the, uh, about a layman. And uh, there is a strong injunction there to join the monastic community, even uh -huh. though it's uh, purely Mahayana, Mahayana um, teachings. Mm. Uh, and then you have the Mahas. And I think that when you when you describe and you call something pitaka uh, mm. in a Tibetan Buddhist setting, it's a fairly, uh, yeah, it's a, a quite significant word because a pitaka mm. is a huge collection. And I mean, it's a tripitaka uh, with the sutra and the vinaya and the abhidharma. And then you have a fourth pitaka. And of course, this mm. happened probably, that what is the Staviravada, and uh, well, uh, you could say that dynamics of religions are all often uh, discussions and disagreement. Mm -hmm. And in the Buddhist tradition, you find a lot of disagreement. And in the Mahayana Sutra, well, uh, you find an increasing criticism of the Stavira, of the Theravada, whatever you call it. But mm. the Sattva Pitaka is not like that. So mm. I, together with the Pranyaparamita, I, I tend to place it uh, that it's codified after, after the Pranyaparamita, but before the Mahasanipata, and indeed before the Vimalakirti type of sutras. Mm. That's really, really interesting, because I think we tend to have a tendency to think, right, uh, Mahayana is a bit anti-monasticism, even though we know that's an overgeneralization. But there is this sense of, because there's so many famous Mahayana sutras, like the Malakirti Nirdesha, where, you know, there's the, the monastics are being made fun of, and the bodhisattvas are sort of the antithesis to the monastics in some way. So we you have a tendency to think of them as separate. But you're pointing out that in this text we're talking about today, the Bodhisattva Pitaka, um, 
it's talking about bodhisattvas, it's talking about the qualities and virtues and how to be a bodhisattva, but at the same time, the Buddha is telling a layman all the kind of benefits of being a monastic and actually really promoting the way of the renunciate. That's very interesting. Yes, so this, and of course, this tension you find all throughout Buddhism. I mean, mm -hmm. the tension and the cooperation between the monastic community and society at large. And of course, this is reflected in, in, uh, in, uh, in the ethics and in the philosophy and everywhere. So you mm -hmm. could say that, uh, well, religions then, including Buddhism, develop because of uh, um, disagreement. And discussion. An ongoing but, uh, conversation, yeah. Yes. And then, of course, um, we should, be, after all, be happy that Buddhism is not that much used as a war ideology. So they keep, they keep their, uh, they keep their um, discussions uh, as a conversation, as you say, which I mm -hmm. think is very fine about Buddhism. Yes, yes. I agree. But anyway, this uh, disagreements within the Buddhism is a kind of dynamics, and and you could see that, uh, and of course, uh, between Buddhism and uh, and uh, the Hindu tradition, of course, is the Atman question, which also is a strong disagreement, and this goes on and on throughout Indian Indian uh, tradition, and it creates. Mm -hmm. It creates philosophy, it creates various systems uh, as dialogue. Mm -hmm. And this dialogue you also find within Buddhism. I mean, between <clears throat> Theravada, uh, Mahayana, you find it also, of course, between uh, Madhyamaka and uh, Yogacara. And uh, I think uh, uh, this is, uh, well, this is uh, human existence. This is how we are. But... Yes. Uh, but of course, what is very central in the Mahasanipata and also the Bodhisattva Pitaka is the ability to unify opposites. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of teachings of Advaya. Mm -hmm. Well, we can discuss, we can have disagreement, but this is also uh, seeing disagreements, seeing duality is also a way into non-duality, Advaya, which of course mm. is uh, very much uh, uh, significant and laid emphasis on in, in Mahayana Sutras. Mm, yes, you're pointing out for us the fact that religious traditions are internally diverse, right? The fact that these different schools of philosophical thought exist means that there's there's some contention over certain specific details, but it's an ongoing dialogue, which is also what makes the tradition rich and fascinating. Um, uh... Yeah. And I wanted to I wanted to go back to a little point you made earlier. Um, you singled out the word pitaka, which is in the title of this text, the Bodhisattva Pitaka, which we've translated as the collected teachings of the Bodhisattva. Um, well, pitaka is the term basket, as in, you know, the tripitaka, the three baskets that we all know, sutra, vinaya, abhidharma. What is the, can you just dwell on the sign significance of this word choice for a second? Uh, what is the significance of this text being called the bodhisattva pitaka? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, uh, pitaka in, in this Buddhist setting it means a kind of total collection of teachings. I mean, the sutras are, you know, a collection which is, yeah, this is this is it kind of uh, thing. Uh, it is uh, it's an attempt to make a complete teaching, and and um, in fact, I think that the Bodhisattva Pitaka is such an attempt. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, during the second century in uh, India, there was the great uh, emperor Karnishka. And Karnishka, the emperor, he called uh, a council. And the Tibetan description of this council, it says that Karnishka asked the question, what is really this Buddhism? 
what is it? There are so many texts all around. I don't understand what is true Buddhism. So he called that council and um, with uh, lots of uh, learned scholars at the time. Um, and uh, that must have been an incitement. This coincides more or less with the, the, the kind of formalization and additions of Mahayana Sutras. So I think that uh, the Pitaka, it could be a kind of answer this is it. This is the collection. This is the complete mm -hmm. Mahayana. Please. So it's an attempt to systematize and make the complete teaching of Mahayana. That's mm -hmm. why it's called Pitaka. But uh, there are also an interesting fact that uh, as um, that um, in the several pieces of the Bodhisattva Pitaka is quoted in the Mahasanipata, in the mm -hmm. Akshaya Matine Desha, uh, completely. It's kind of uh, taken from the Bodhisattva Pitaka and put into the Akshaya Matine Desha. For example, it's also in the 84,000, this Akshaya mm -hmm. Matine Desha, the, the imperishability teaching of Mahayana Buddhism, also found in the Bodhisattva Pitaka. But mm. then I think the Mahasanipata is also another attempt to make a complete exposition of Mahayana Buddhism. Mm. And it seems that that uh, Bodhisattva Pitaka must have been very important in the second century and, and at the time. And we have also other fragments throughout the uh, history of the Bodhisattva Pitaka, even in Karoshti, this uh, kind of Gandharan version. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, Bodhisattva Pitaka, uh, as we have it, is very pure and fine Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, but uh, but uh, it's fine. Found versions are also found in Karoshti in Gandhari language of this. Mm. So it has it was a process of formalization. Mm. But then uh, the Bodhisattva Pitaka is not so much quoted by, for example, the Shiksha Samuchaya by the mm. various commentators throughout the uh, history of Buddhism who made uh, anthologies. Because mm. they made anthologies, because to read these huge sutras, well, it takes some time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then it was kind of superseded by the Mahasanipata. Mm. And the Mahasanipata is also, as it is said by Tibetan scholars and other scholars, is an attempt to make a complete exposition of, of Mahayana Buddhism exactly as the Bodhisattva Pitaka. So I think this name Pitaka comes from that. I see. Thank you for that very thorough explanation. Pitaka in the sense that in a way it collects together all of the parts of the Mahayana insofar as the Mahayana is the path of the Bodhisattva in some way. Look, this is, this is Mahayana Buddhism. This is, this is, this is the know. Bodhisattva path, right. That's very, yeah. that's very interesting. Actually, speaking of, so it seems like from what you said, there's a sense that the Bodhisattva Pitaka was a very important source text um, for the Mahayana, for the path of the Bodhisattva. Um, and, you know, within the text, it, the Buddha talks about the four immeasurables. He talks about the six perfections and so forth, uh, concepts we really associate with the Bodhisattva. And you also mentioned the Shisha Samuchaya and how it doesn't really quote from this text. I was actually going to ask you, you know, to what do, extent do you think this is a major source text for topics like the six perfections. Um, do you think that someone like Shanti Deva, maybe not, since you said you know it's not quoted in the Shiksha Samuchaya, but like, do you think someone like Shanti Deva, for example, a few centuries later, would have consulted a text like this when he was composing the Bodhicharya yes. Tara? They they all knew, of course, yeah. and it was an important text. But uh, in, in, as for the Shiksha Samuchaya and several other of those common, similar commentaries, they mm. rather quoted the Akshaya Matini Desha. But the right. Akshaya Matini Desha, as for the teachings, as for the Branya Paramita, as for the uh, the various, uh, the Brahma Vihara and the uh, 
all these uh, in the uh, all these qualities of the bodhisattva are more or less the same mm. in in uh, bodhisattva pitaka and akshayamata and Desha. so mm. they are very close as as uh, the scholar uh, yeah this has been discussed which was the first mm. and i originally had the idea that uh, Akshaya Matini Desha might have been the first, but I think I was wrong. And uh, mm. Ulrich Pagel, uh, professor in SOAS, uh, he also did some work on the on the Akshaya Matini Desha and the Bodhisattva Pitaka uh, of the kind of historical relation. And he, I think, uh, was right, and I was wrong, uh, that the Bodhisattva Pitaka is the source of the Akshaya Matini Desha. But how long time this is, and this is very difficult to say. Maybe only some year, some years, maybe a hundred years. We don't know mm. that, and it's very difficult to to um, to find out. But what is absolutely certain is that the uh, well, uh, I during this um, translation, which took in fact quite a long time. Uh, but that was also because we made a critical or diplomatic, as we say, edition of the, of the Sanskrit text of the Bodhisattva Pitaka. Mm. And this is also, uh, this we, we made, and this will now also appear, the Sanskrit text of the Bodhisattva Pitaka. It will appear in the, in the Austrian Academy of Science, who has a series on Sanskrit text from Tibet. Mm. And uh, under their program, uh, under their, uh, I, 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 we have also made a, a, an a edition. And this mm. edition of the text is based on a manuscript kept in the Potala. Mm. And uh, it has uh, come into the uh, photographs of that uh, uh, manuscript has come into the hands of uh, Professor Einstein Kellner in, in Vienna. And the, mm. he has edited and he and his people has edited a series of such text from Tibet. Uh, in cooperation with uh, with uh, the Tibetan Center in Beijing, and oh. uh, this uh, text uh, is part of that. So uh, we have both the Tibetan version, we have Xianzang's version in Chinese from, uh, yeah, I think six forty five, isn't it? And then we have uh, have uh, so there is quite a lot of material. So oh. evidently, it was a very popular text. Oh. Uh, uh, and uh, it was quoted, it was not so much quoted, but it was studied. And this manuscript from Tibet, from Potala, ending up as photographs in our hands, what a privilege. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this uh, we, uh, it will also be available uh, uh, soon. It's, it should be out uh, during uh, this year at least, maybe this spring. But what I wanted to say, uh, this manuscript originally comes from North India. Mm. Comes maybe from Nalanda, from uh, uh, one of these great universities, uh, mm. Buddhist universities in the ninth century, because the script shows us that it's written in the ninth century. And the quality of the manuscript on palm leaf is so good. And it's uh, so correctly written, very few errors. So this shows that, uh, as to answer your question, how long was this Bodhisattva Pitaka popular? How long was it read? So at least it, it had a very fine manuscript uh, made at uh, just before 900, we think. And uh, so at least then it was very popular, mm. as it deserved. Because writing such a manuscript was economically a huge job. As we mm. know, to produce manuscripts today is easy. But in Tibet, in north of India, uh, scholars, scribes writing this was a huge economy, of course. Mm. It's, it's really amazing, the um, Sanskrit texts that 
we've been able to get more recently from the Potala. Um, it's, and to just imagine that perhaps this manuscript of the Bodhisattva Pitaka came from Nalanda and to imagine it as maybe part of Nalanda's monastic library or something like that. And it was brought back yeah. to Tibet. It's quite amazing to think about yeah, that. Yeah, these are a bit of fantasies, but they are not yeah. complete fantasies. They are right. hypothetical scenarios. Right, and uh, right, exactly. and uh, we see that this manuscript is kept in Tibet for a thousand years, maybe mm. more. Yeah. And this is, of course, amazing. And it's annotated with mm. uh, with uh, Ume script, and mm. uh, annotated here and there chapters in Tibetan with Ume script. So they wrote on Which... on it to make it uh, systematically and for uh, lib library use. In right. Tibet. Which tells us they were really being used, these texts, which is yes. really, really amazing. Uh, and Thanks. we have asked ourselves whether mm -hmm. was this beautiful manuscript the the original which they used for translating uh, uh, translating mm -hmm. the Bodhisattva into Tibetan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, was it what does the Forlaga, as we say, was it the, the original text? And mm -hmm. we are not sure. Because mm -hmm. some places it, it is it is uh, there are signs mm -hmm. that because if there are small errors if there are kind of various readings you can see uh, mm -hmm. but we are not sure whether that was the case some things uh, points in that direction other uh, other information points in another way but maybe they used more manuscripts mm -hmm. because I mean this translating. Uh, from uh, I mean from uh, the eighth century, seventh century, translating uh, text into Tibetan, uh, of course, was an amazing feat. How they did this, making lexica, making grammar, making you know uh, terminology, building this kind of translation project. It took, yeah, hundreds of years maybe, but this mm -hmm. is. A, as a linguistic uh, activity, it is just amazing and almost unique yeah. uh, because it was so accurate and it was so well done. So, mm -hmm. of course, people working in the 84,000, they can mirror themselves in that great event uh, in uh, around before and uh, after 800. Right. Uh, yeah, I think that really is the ethos of 84,000 to try to emulate, you know, the translators, the, the sort of yeah. the kind of expansive view and mission the translators of the past had. Um, it's yeah. quite amazing. Um, I have a small question that perhaps um, you could help us. Please, help uh, the please, audience. please go ahead and stop me if I talk too much. No, no, no. We love <laughs> everything you have to say. Um but I wanted you to speak on the spelling of Bodhisattva just so that everybody knows that it's not a typo. <laughs> because in this particular translation, of course, you've spelt Bodhisattva with just one T. And, you know, most English readers will be familiar with Bodhisattva spelt with two Ts, Bodhisattva. But um, can you just explain very briefly why it's oh, spelt this it, way in your translation? It, 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 is it, be is yeah. it because of what you find in the Sanskrit manuscript? Isn't that a terrible question? <laughs> but I have a specific reason for doing that, and it does yeah. follow. Because yeah. I haven't seen in a single original manuscript the writing Bodhisattva with two Ts. Mm. Have you seen it where in Tibetan? No, where does that come from? Where does yeah, the I, 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 I'll tell you. Yeah. And uh, in in uh, Thai, of course, Thai have uh, Brahmi, uh, not Devanagari, and Brahmi script related yeah. to Devanagari, one T. Mm. Tibetan titles when uh, Tibetan writes uh, uh, writes in their uh, their uh, write Sanskrit with Tibetan letters, one yeah. T. Right. Manuscript, one T. So where and, did we get this idea from? <laughs> yeah. This is a very, very bad uh, Orientalism, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's, I think it's invented uh, by Western scholars. Mm. And, uh, and of course, you have Bodhisattva 
in Pali. Yeah. And then, of course, the Buddhist literature, first written in Pali, first written in Karoshti, per, first written in various kinds of, of non-Sanskrit uh, uh, versions and dialects. Mm -hmm. Pali, one of them. Uh, and of course, the study of Indian dialects is a big study. And then, well, at some point, I think third century, uh, maybe second, also the Buddhist. Because, I mean, the Buddhist has this idea in that Sanskrit is not a sacred language. Uh, I yeah. mean, it is, uh, and Buddhism can be taught in any language by mm -hmm. The Vedas, you know, Upanishad has to be Sanskrit. Uh, Quran has to be Arabic. But mm. Buddhism has the idea whichever language uh, is understandable, whichever language can carry thinking, uh, significance, uh, what it means. Go ahead, use it. And then, of course, Buddhism has all these languages. But in the end, they go back to Sanskrit too. Because Sanskrit, mm -hmm. of course, beautiful and fine and uh, language and uh, unified. So um, Buddhists, they start, I mean, the Sanskritization uh, is a kind of scholarly term for that process. You start to write, write Buddhist texts in Sanskrit again and you formalize them. But in the Bodhisattva Pitaka, you have the prose is in pure Sanskrit or more or less. And, uh, and the verses, the songs, they are always in in. Uh, yeah, Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, as they call it, uh, mm. and, which is a dialect, of course, which is kept. So Buddhism is that a mix. So Bodhisattva, uh, Pali, uh, how should you Sanskritize it? Yes, mm. Bodhisattva, and according to Sanskrit grammar, you don't have, you can use a double T, like in the word tattva. You can use double T, but often you just uh, use one T. Mm -hmm. And Buddhists mm -hmm. do that. So mm -hmm. then I find it correct that uh, it, for, because of grammar, you could argue that you should have two Ts. But it's not absolutely certain, and it's a mm -hmm. discussion, and there is a scholarly literature on it. For those who are interested, we have mm -hmm. at the end, of our introduction, then we have quoted a, a scholarly work on the question. But but uh, I'm sorry if I provoke anybody by writing one thing. But I think it's correct from the beginning. So you see no, this. I've, uh, yeah. No, I've seen this elsewhere as well. I know that this is, um, many people are proponents of spelling bodhisattva this way, but I just wanted you to share with the audience why. And I think that's a very compelling thing. If it's not attested to, you know, in Sanskrit text, then maybe it's, you know, <laughs> there's, maybe it's been made up by Orientalist scholars. Um, yeah, but uh, I mean, Orientalists, they are, of course, the grand researchers of Buddhism, which of, right, course, of course meant a lot for Buddhism in the West. I mean, yes, the scholarly yes. work on Buddhism, so to call them and say they're Orientalists and bad people, that's no. not in my no, taste. No, 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 <laughs> not to say that. <laughs> but sometimes this word Orientalist has a bit of bad, uh, yeah, well, yes, I don't know. Yes, of course. But of course, this research, receiving Buddhism uh, during the 18th century, uh, particularly in the last half, it, I mean, 19th century, that was, of course, a very, uh, yeah, for Buddhism, it was a very good thing. And the scholarly work of Buddhism, I think, have contributed. And of course, Buddhism is, a, is itself a learned tradition in China, in Tibet, everywhere, in India, right. not to talk about India. So, so Buddhism was always connected to uh, philosophy, philology, disciplines which we still have in modern universities. Yes, that's true, of course. And all of our work today build upon the work of those predecessors. So not not trying to dismiss them in any way. Um, perhaps now I was thinking we could move on to a discussion about the contents of the text and dwell on some details. Um, so in chapter three of the collected teachings of the Bodhisattva, that's really where the discussion about Bodhisattvas begin. Uh, it's where Shariputra asked the Buddha about the qualities 
of a bodhisattva. And I'll read very briefly from uh, the verses in chapter three. So in chapter three, verses four and five, Shariputra asks the Buddha, he says, with what purpose do these heroes set out to reach awakening? Tell us of the virtuous qualities through which they attain supreme realization. How do these heroes act for the benefit of all who live? How do they practice the Dharma to become Buddhas, the best of men? I just want to point out how similar this is in a way it, when I was reading it to the opening lines of the Iliad and the Odyssey. <laughs> because <laughs> where the poet is, right, Homer is asking the muses to speak about the heroes of the Greek tradition. But there, mm. of course, there he's asking the muse to speak about the wrath of Achilles and, and the wiles or the cunning of Odysseus, right? Whereas here, Shariputra is asking about a very different kind of hero, the Bodhisattva. Um, anyway, mm. so then the Buddha answers Shariputra's question and says that the single quality that makes someone a bodhisattva is having a foundation of their being as the resolve of the mind of awakening. Um, can you mm. explain to us uh, what the Buddha <laughs> means here by the foundation of resolve? This is a term that the Buddha elaborates on in chapter three. What does he emphasize about the mind of awakening here? Mm -hmm. Yes, the bodhicitta, uh, mind of awakening, thought of awakening, uh, in, uh, it's also connected to a kind of vow, a kind of promise that, uh, that uh, of course, I will not uh, give up helping other people and any living being. I will never stop that. Uh, and I will give that priority always for endless ages rather than give priority to my own uh, own intentions. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, you also have this idea of the para-atma, uh, that you should do things for others, para and atma, for yourself. But the para is, of course, to practice the paramitas uh, for the sake of all living beings. And, uh, and uh, the, the atma, uh, in what you do for yourself, that is the body, that is the spiritual development, if you like, that is the various stages you go through in your development towards complete awakening. But then you have this idea in the Bodhisattva Pitaka and also in Mahayana Sutras in general that, um, well, you never reach awakening because it's not something to be reached. And you never uh, accomplish it uh, because it is nothing. It is emptiness. Mm. So this is part of a kind of rhetorical or even philosophical idea that uh, awakening body, uh, it, on the one side, you can't attain it because your commitment to helping all living beings will be forever because living beings will be forever. And the bodhicitta is the promise that you should never stop this. You should never think of your own body before, as long as there is somebody suffering in among living beings. So this is the bodhicitta promise, which is very radical, <laughs> you might say. And then on the one side, you have that, um, that you have that, uh, it will take endless time to help all living beings. Mm -hmm. On the other side, you uh, you have that um, that uh, idea from Nagarjuna from Mahayana Sutras that time really doesn't exist, mm -hmm. 
and then of course you you have to co to to kind of understand those two ideas together mm. that uh, your commitment will be forever mm. for endless time on the other side um since time doesn't exist you are really awakened just now mm. and this also a very important tenant of course in mahayana buddhism and it mm. gives gives rise to the idea of the tathagata garbha mm. uh, that every single being is really a potential buddha mm. So these teachings uh, is usually uh, usually uh, identified or seen as integrated in the yoga chara philosophy, but you find this also in many many of these sutras that you construct time, you construct your your um, views, but in fact they are constructions and that seeing through your mental constructions this is your freedom and that's freedom kind of beyond time mm -hmm. so these are very very uh, sophisticated thinking and uh, I think that all the Mahayana Sutras, which we have mentioned, they share these kinds of reflections on existence. And uh, and uh, this is, of course, connected to the bodhicitta, that uh, it's a promise mm -hmm. to help all living beings. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. For you have helped them to reach happiness and nirvana, you shouldn't think of yourself. So it's a very kind of radical altruism, you could say. Right. Maybe yeah. something, in, also something I think we will never reach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sort of, um, even if, uh, I can't remember the term that Stephen Collins uses, um, but it's sort of this idea of a figure who represents a kind of ideal. And even if it's not an ideal, you yourself think, you can achieve it's very important that that ideal figure exists in mm -hmm. in our minds and in our world as a possibility as a possibility that there are those who are walking that path in some way i really lo love how you just explain the explain bodhicitta as it appears in this text um this resolve as a promise you know it, and it really you see it you see that interpretation being being taken to its fullest extent in something like, you know, Shanti Deva's Bodhitari Avatara, where it's very, he's very explicit, you know, this is, you can't break this promise now that you've made it, you know, now that you've said you will commit yourself to the welfare of all beings, how terrible would it be if you broke that promise? Um, and, and you see it in this text as well. Thank you for explaining that for us. Um, I think, yeah. No, no, please go ahead. Please go ahead. No, I, I also I just uh, thought I would mention this idea. Uh, and one of the, what I always say, which I think is the greatness of Mahayana thinking, is that how they can, uh, can uh, harmonize uh, this very positive ethics with mm. the kind of negative ontology this kind of emptiness uh, teaching mm -hmm. and uh, of course uh, this is a very sophisticated thing i think in buddhism mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also connected with this uh, negative ontology is all is really constructed mm -hmm. and this con this i think is very important in mahayana buddhism that we Hmm. we construct ourselves, we construct an object of our needs and our various kinds of wishes, mm -hmm. and then we act according to that. Mm -hmm. But according to Mahayana Buddhism, this is somehow 
constructed all of the time. Mm. And uh, this concept is called Kalpa and Vikalpa, Kalpana, mm. uh, as surely many, many of you have heard of. Well, but I find it very interesting that, uh, uh, that this French existentialism and even with the passion, maybe no over, of, of Derrida, of deconstruction, deconstruction. Mm -hmm. uh, then says Derrida, no, this is a very modern idea. This is something I found out. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, the concept deconstruction is exact counterpart of Sanskrit nirvikalpa. Mm -hmm. And nir is the is the negation, V is kind of conflict, and kalpa means to build, construct. Mm -hmm. So deconstruction, deconstruction philosophy, French, uh, is uh, yeah, they should know, they should read Nagarjuna, I say. They should read <laughs> Mahana Sutra. <laughs> this was 2,000 years ago, and the right. project is so similar. That we yeah. always construct nationality, we construct history, we construct this and that, and then mm. we debate. Mm. And exactly this very modern, popular philosophical concept is prefigured 2,000 years ago in Mahayana Sutras. This is, uh, I think, is a grandeur of, of, of Buddhism. And, of course, French uh, existentialism, they never think of ethics. Mm -hmm. Uh, they never, they have their negative view. They say we construct everything, but they end up as a kind of yourself. You should be strong yourself. Uh, but in uh. Buddhism comes the only way to understand that there is no self. This is to act out there. This is to uh. do good. Uh, in that uh, way, by doing good, you understand that things are constructed, not uh, by making kind of intellectual views. And this also very strong, I think, that uh, uh, that um, in um, they say that danam uh, bodhisattva bodhir. So giving generosity is the uh, awakening of the bodhisattva. Mm. And this is, of course, the first uh, perfection. Yeah. And, uh, of course, this has to do that giving is about to uh, get out of yourself and to get rid of your vikalpa, in a sense. Mm. So, this I, I admire a lot. With, uh, mm. So, they are... I think Mahayana Buddhism accomplished many phil things philosophically, which still remains for modern philosophy to see. Mm. Thank you so much for bringing out that aspect of Mahayana for us. Yeah, it's it's so true that it's, you know, in a in a text like Bodhisattva Pitaka, but you see it in other Mahayana texts too, where it, they're so good at uniting these seemingly oppositional kind of things you know so on the one hand yes everything is constructed sure everything is constructed there's no inherent essence and yet right and yet the bodhisattva and yet the person who yeah. acts in order to sort of engage in the way of the bodhisattva one must act as if it mm. were not constructed as if it meant something right and but perhaps the only way to actually fully embody the path of the bodhisattva is to also understand that things are constructed because otherwise you wouldn't be able to fully enact the other part. It's very interesting. And, and just like what you said, the ethical component, you know, it's not just an intellectual exercise. It's not just about, you know, theorizing kind of, oh, everything is constructed and this and that, but actually what does that mean for how one behaves in the world? Um, thank you for bringing that out. And of course, the bodhisattva, as we started uh, with, then the bodhisattva is translated as, you know, Jung to uh, Senpa. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jung, of course, to awaken, uh, Chub is to, to open like a lotus flower, and, mm -hmm. uh, and the Sem is the Chitta, uh, and the Pa is the hero. And mm -hmm. uh, you find that word in Sanskrit, Chitta Shura. Chitta, mm -hmm. uh, thought, 
Shura mm-hmm. hero. Mm-hmm. So so when they built that word bodhisattva, they discussed, uh, yes, in the works of uh, far back, 1200 years yeah. ago, they discussed, you know, what does it mean in Sanskrit? And then they reasoned and reflected, and then they end up with this uh, Tibetan uh, constructed word. But it mm-hmm. has a strong, uh, they, so they wanted to bring in all those four aspects of mm-hmm. the word bodhisattva, namely awakening, uh, namely unfolding like a lotus, but mm. also the the mind thing and the hero thing, your right. I- Iliad uh, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that uh, that uh, Bodhisattva, yes, he's a hero, but he's a mind hero. Yes, but but uh, they're also quite interesting in a sutra called Gagana Ganja, which is now also being translated with one of my students, doctoral students, Gagana Ganja, they have a very interesting simile. Similar. It's being translated. Uh, it's uh, not ready yet, but I hope it will come soon in the 84,000. Then the Mahayana Buddhism is, uh, is described as a cart. Mm. As a cart uh, and the bodhisattva as a hero, and uh, and the horses are pranya and upaya, mm-hmm. and the wagon, the wheels, every part of this uh, uh, this chariot is an yeah. image of, of bodhisattva. So the it's discussed whether Mahayana means the great way, or it means mm. the great cart, because ah. yana. Yana in Sanskrit is that, it's described as that by which you go. Mm, and right. what do you go, what is that? It's both the road and the cart. Right, right. So the great, uh, the, the great vehicle could literally be vehicle, not, not a figurative kind of vehicle in the sense of a path. But, but it is, it is yeah. the vehicle. Uh, yes. I mean, it is yes. the vehicle, which is the similar yeah. and the kind of, and the bodhisattva is the hero on the vehicle, yeah. Yeah. and he, well, he never gives in. Right, so right. This is, right. Uh, this is the image, a metaphor, you could say, yes. uh, which yeah. is employed for the for the bodhisattva. So this, and and that plays into what we talked about before, namely that the bodhisattva he is acting out there. Mm. Uh, and of course that's the criticism of monasticism and all of that but mm. we should never forget who kept Buddhism alive the monasteries yes <laughs> right right right. so the bodhisattva the is Sangha. The one... yes of course You must, so a bodhisattva must hold all of these things together right it's, yes that's it's the, the person who acts in the world you know for the benefit of beings but you have to also understand all the other components. That's yeah. I, I love I love the sort of uh, co-opting of this very martial imagery, right? Like a hero as a warrior in a chariot going off yeah. to battle. Here it's a mind warrior, and mm-hmm. and the Tibetan translation of the term bodhisattva is so masterful in some ways because yeah, it's it. condensed, but it's a portmanteau that kind of combines all the elements that the translators thought were important in describing. A bodhisattva. Mm. So that's yeah. very cool. Yeah. Mm. Um, I also wanted to ask you, so, you know, the text goes through, uh, a majority of the text is on the six perfections. And the final mm. chapter, it ends with the, the final perfection of wisdom. Um, mm. And there, the Buddha teaches, is still talking to Shariputra. And he says um, in chapter 11, and around verse 42, um, He tells him about how to engage in bodhisattva practices in a non-superficial way. You translated this as a non-superficial way. And he says that non-superficial engagement means non-engagement. What does that that mean there Um, when the Buddha is telling him how to be non-superficial? Yeah. So... So this is an idea, Mahayana idea, of course, which is comes from the Pratitya Samutpada, the, 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 the 
origin of, yeah. yeah of the 12 the, the the chain of 12 causes in the origin of suffering mm -hmm. and then in mahayana sutras they they have avidya of in uh, traditionally they have avidya uh, ignorance as the first mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then mahayana sutras they they say that avidya it comes from Ayonisho Manasikara. So, mm. so uh, Manasikara, mental effort, uh, which is Ayonisho, Ayonishach. And that means not fundamental, mm. not basic. So that's mm. how this, but it's a bit mysterious, this, uh, of course, because. But they like to say in Mahayana Buddhism, yes, Pratitya Samutpada is fine, uh, and this is a kind of causal uh, existence, uh, origin of existence. But of mm -hmm. course, in Mahayana, they generalize this mm. and saying that everything is dependent on everything. Mm. And in in some sutras, you have a similar Pratitya Samutpada, but they like in Mahayana sutras to put emphasis on this Vikalpa idea. Parikalpa, Vikalpa, uh, and Kalpana, and such things. And also on Upalamba, it's so a construction that we construct our... our um, our uh, understanding of uh, uh, of um, existence, mm. but we also there is another word prapancha, which means to be talkative or inner discursive thinking. So we can't stop constructing our our um, existence mm. and. That is a kind of parallel to the Pratitya Samutpada. Well, it comes from karma, it comes from, from sanskara and all of these things. I think we have read uh, mm -hmm. formative factors, consciousness, and then it develops into a kind of multiplicity. Mm -hmm. uh, but then Mahayana Buddhism says, well, these concepts are all constructions. Yeah. This is basically what we do. We construct you, we construct me, we construct an enemy, then we hate him, uh, or we construct, uh, and all of that. So, all the, so Mahayana Buddhism put very strong emphasis on this. And that all starts with a lack of, uh, yeah, authentic thinking, if you like to use such a fashion word. It is mm -hmm. a lack of non-fundamental thinking so mm. this is how i understand that concept and it's mm. fairly frequent in connection with this we call things and i think all the all the sutras have some section on this emptiness construction dichotomy yeah. you find that everywhere and then this uh, manasikara it sneaks in that's where it starts that's mm -hmm. where you you may make, and this is also a bit of Mahayana criticism, because mm -hmm. uh, they criticize Abhidharma concepts for being essentialistic, for being entities, and they say, well, these are not entities; they are just mm -hmm. thought constructions, and that mm -hmm. starts with, uh, yeah, this. Mm -hmm. So to be non-superficial on the you know it, in terms of engaging with the bodhisattva activities or path is to kind of recognize the constructedness of, um, of even your thoughts maybe it's just um if you use a very free modern translation it's just just wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> i love that <laughs> just reflect reflect on it Start yeah before you do anything before... just wait a minute yeah, 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 and, uh, and if before, you have that gap, uh, just uh, wait a all minute. The kinds of of uh, of um, yes, kind of um, uh, 
things and or you start to make your fake news <laughs> right exactly just wait a minute yeah if we all just said that to ourselves um yeah. perhaps we would all be more aligned <laughs> to yeah, the bodhisattva way could be. um yeah and what you mentioned about pratitya samutpada you know interdependent origination it's very interesting because of course i think a lot of mahayana sutras they don't eschew it right it, they always often have it within the text yeah they do um, absolutely but it's it's often treated almost it seems like it's treated as kind of the conventional level of reality and then they yeah. when they talk about emptiness it's like they're being presented together you know you both have to be taken you know the mm. the level kind of ultimate level of emptiness as well as the relative level of causal you know conditions um all have to be taken into consideration but you could say that, uh, you know, this sometimes very polemical uh, Mahayana Buddhism, because mm. it is. And mm. it's a kind of rhetoric. So I mm. called it was a rhetoric of emptiness. And it's very, <laughs> efficient, very efficient in discussions, right. uh, in a sense. And this particular genre of rhetorics, you could say. Mm. And that Mahayana... So, uh, you can say on one side it's philosophy, on the other side it's a kind of debate, rhetorics, mm -hmm. and of course it's very strong tradition into yeah. Tibet, as we know, yeah. and all the way as we started to talk about. So, yeah. so you could say that uh, there will, would be no Mahayana Buddhism without the Pratitya Samudpada and all right. those original ideas, because yeah. they are the kind of almost a deferred of a Mahayana discussion. Mm. They start and then, okay, they say it's empty. And then you could ask the question, is it philosophy or is it rhetoric or what is this Mahayana Buddhism? This is a kind of negative side. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, um, this belongs to the uh, whole way of thinking that uh, you should have no standpoint and of course, this is uh, when you discuss. And but is that possible? I don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's long discussion. Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. But um... but uh, Bodhisattva Pitaka, of course, and the Pranayaparamita has all. Ha, they have all of these kind of things integrated. Yes. 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 Um. I think I'm going to ask you one final question before we take some questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. So um, we've spoken a lot about the Mahayana in general, as well as the Bodhisattva Pitika, the collection, collected teachings of the Bodhisattva more specifically. Um, can you, you, you spent a very long time translating this text for 84,000. Um, what would you say uh, this text can teach us about the way to embody the bodhisattva ideal in this day and age uh, what lessons can we gain from it what lessons have you taken away from it through the process of translating it yeah mm. Mm -hmm. we read and we work and we act and we do our ordinary things every day but of course all we read we think hope, hopefully in a fundamental way <laughs> and then, of course, uh, uh, I, as you understand, I, I think this Mahayana Buddhism as a philosophy, as ethics, as religion, of course, is very interesting. And uh, I worked with several Mahayana Sutras. Uh, and then, of course, my, my scholarly kind of uh, conclusions is a bit I talked about the historical setting about it because you could say that uh, Bodhisattva Pitaka is much a Mahayana Sutra as many others, but it's a particular taste. It's a particular uh, particular um, uh, particular variant. You could say. But to me, it's difficult to single out the Bodhisattva Pitaka from all the other Mahayana Sutras I have read. Mm. So it kind of builds 
my knowledge of of course of it and as the mahayana says in what we talked about this is a never ending project mm. <laughs> and this <laughs> This uh, sutras, they are so voluminous and uh, you never uh, finish them. So it's like your question. For me, the Bodhisattva Pitaka falls into my general kind of uh, lack of understanding of Mahayana Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. <laughs> <laughs> it makes us it makes us more aware of of yeah. where what we don't know perhaps exactly um, exactly yeah the vastness dope. of the tradition yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well thank you so much i mean this you've shared with us with us so much of the fruit of your um scholarly labor um now i think let us take some questions from the audience um let's see uh, one anonymous attendee um, would like to hear you speak a little bit on the teachings found in Chapter 5 of the Bodhisattva Pitika, which is on the four immeasurables. Um, so loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see. This person says, um, the Bodhisattva Pitika and the Akshaya Mati Nirdesha share this detailed elaboration of the four immeasurable minds. Um, that is unique in Mahayana. However, the teaching, let me see, the teachings, the teaching seems to be of significant importance um, since this chapter is quoted in its entirety. This person is saying this chapter is quoted in its entirety in Shantideva's Shiksha Samuchaya, but I think perhaps, I don't know if that's true. You said that this, um, well, is it? Uh, yeah then maybe i'm wrong <laughs> i'm not i'm not sure either i don't i don't know the shiksha samuchaya or this text well enough um this but person it, is saying that it it is quoted um in the shiksha samuchaya this chapter on the four measurables but in any case they're asking you to speak a little bit more about the presentation of the four measurables in the bodhisattva pitaka Yes, I I think they are uh, very similar to what you find in other Mahayana sutras. But mm. to me, uh, they are of course uh, very uh, important uh, qualities, uh, and uh, and uh, they point very much to a kind of what has been called in modern times socially engaged Buddhism. Mm. Uh, and uh, of course, the, that is true of the of, of also of the paramita of the. Uh, but these uh, are kind of, as I see it, is a kind of uh, appendix to the uh, pranya paramita to the paramita things mm. that uh, that uh, and it's to pinpoint that the the. Maitri and Karuna are very essential uh, qualities of the uh, Bodhisattva. And of course, uh, as we have talked about, uh, the, uh, it is very uh, close to the Bodhicitta. And uh, uh, the Karuna is uh, 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 often connected also to Upaya. Uh, which is the expedient means, I think, often translated. Mm. Uh, so expedient means that uh, what people do should be based on on uh, compassion, on karuna. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a kind of, uh, and we have, uh, 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 as I the 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 conjunction or the 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 union of pranya of wisdom. And of uh, upaya, uh, this is of course the advaya that you have knowledge, but you act. So mm. this kind of, uh, and you find everywhere, of course, that Buddha is Maha Karunika. He mm -hmm. is the great compassionate one. Mm. So, uh, so, so I think that this for they are also called Brahma Vihara. The Mahayana Brahma Vihara. And Brahma Vihara, of course, Vihara means uh, 
uh, means to uh, appearance or 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 behavior mm-hmm. and brahma uh, often in uh, it means brahma of course but it came to mean purity mm-hmm. and uh, of course the vinaya is very interested in uh, and they pinpoint by the vinaya, vinaya rules that uh, one should act in purity mm. but uh, but uh, the the pure behavior <coughs> of a bodhisattva is not <coughs> to keep a distance it's not to mm-hmm. to be a kind of pure existence in isolation. My, the bodhisattva uh, ideal is to act with upaya mm. and karuna. Mm. And then, of course, the karuna is uh, in tension with uh, uh, maitri. And that's explained in Mahayana Sutras that uh, karuna is something that's protecting the weak. And maitri is friendship, uh, is friendship to everybody. And you have that in particular in in the in the pedagogical situation that that uh, you don't you have an acharya yes but most of all you have a kalyana mitra you have a good friend who teaches you oh. so this is placed very much on the egalitarianism in in Buddhism that you are not necessarily. Uh, yeah, this tolerance thing. You are not necessarily, uh, uh, if you think you're a very important person, Acharya, in your next life, you will be in hell. So you have this <laughs> kind of stories in the sense that, uh, uh, so this Maitri Karuna plays into the egalitarianism of, of uh, Buddhism. Mm-hmm. Then you have Bodhita, which means joy. This is your name, so that's very. <laughs> so you could have a Sanskrit name, Mudita, uh, in 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 addition, and of course, Mudita is uh, is uh, is that uh, you're not a negative, pessimistic person. The Bodhisattva is not a negative uh, person, and that's underlined. And this is the kind of social morality. You should be a positive power. You shouldn't Mm. necessarily hide away. You should Mm. be there, and you should be happy. You should go ahead. And then this Upeksha, I'm sorry, this I don't quite understand. So, but... (laughs) The equanimity, the picture, yeah. yeah. But it's something you should have equanimity towards something. But mm-hmm. as for helping all living beings, you should not have equanimity. I think there's some explanations like that. And then I'm relieved, of course. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I really like the way you said it. You know, a bodhisattva is someone who knows, meaning who who, who has knowledge, knows reality, knows the way things are, yet still acts. Someone who yeah, knows, but still acts. Very and so, strong. And yeah. it's called Yoganada. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's a tantric term. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Pranya Upaya Yoganada Vahi Marga. Uh, the way where you drive with two horses and the one is, uh, is uh, uh, upaya and the other is pranya, very similar, similar to Phaedrus by Plato, mm. where they rode two horses uh, uh, on a carriage, which is good and bad and such things. Mm. I hope this was a bit of answer. Yes, yes, this is a very nice answer. Thank you. All right, we'll take two more questions. Um, uh, a, a participant named Andrew Jung um, asks. As a practitioner, so if someone's a practitioner going on to the 84,000 online reading room, they go into this text, Bodhisattva Pitaka, uh, how should they navigate it? What would be an important highlight to read? Or, you know, it's a long text, right? So if, if a practitioner is not necessarily reading the whole thing through, I mean, how would you recommend that they read it? What's an important way of highlight of the text? I think you should read it fast and get inspired. Mm, mm, read it for inspiration yeah and read it fast and if you don't understand uh, all the things just go ahead and oh, if you like, haven't yeah. understood it enough then read it once more if you like mm-hmm, mm. 
So to not I say uh, this because I say this because I use such a long time to read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but in some ways that's very good advice for reading a lot of sutra literature mm. because some of them are so long and can seem so opaque, you know, when you first encounter it. Mm. But maybe there's something to be said about just getting through it first and then going back if you want and seeing what inspires you or what grabs you. Um, uh, I think essentially there are many multi. I mean, this they, you could see Mahayana Sutras as a kind of uh, personification of an idea, mm. which is the name of a, of a bodhisattva. For example, mm. Shayamati, the imperishable mm. intelligence, and mm -hmm. he is in, in, uh, made into a person, and this is the uh, hero of the story you could say so and then you have motis but very much is similar in mahayana sutras so this is why i also say you should read just read them through and then oh. you will find uh, much of the same things in other in the other sutras but the oh. motives and the, the protagonists and of course the stories and the background stories and the places are different but oh. Mahayana Buddhism is Buddhism, and uh, Mahayana Buddhism is Mahayana Buddhism, and then it's similar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, now a final question. Um, I hope we have time for you to answer this, but this person, it's an anonymous attendee, says this is a classic question. Um, it's a bit of a question in the vein of sort of hermeneutics of suspicion, <laughs> I would say, but it's an important question, and so this person asks, are Mahayana texts like the Akshayamati Nyajesha Sutra and others really the Buddha's teachings, or are they the writings of pioneering Mahayana masters? Uh, you know, if they're actually the Buddha's teachings, why is the content so different in terms of the, the style compared to early Buddhist texts as if it were spoken by a different person? So this is a question, uh, you know, a, a classic question about Mahayana. What is the Mahayana? Is it really the teachings of the Buddha? How long time do I have? One I know, two. exactly. We only have 10 <laughs> minutes left, but I saved the, the big one for last. This no, is a huge but question. I think, I think, I mean, you could see this in various ways. And uh, of course, within the Buddhist tradition, all the sutras are the words of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, of course, but in which way? And when were they written down? And what was oral tradition? What did it change? Why are there so many sects? And this, of course, is human. Uh, human. We produce texts. And as we talked about, as we started with almost, why did Karnishka say there are so many texts around? Please tell me what is pure, the true Buddhism, said Karnishka, probably, if, if the information is correct. So this is, is always a question, but it's a good answer. Uh, mm. The Buddha says you have to find out yourself. Mm. <laughs> but of course, we we make we make hist I think I mean the historical way of understanding this is that uh, is that uh, thinking is changing throughout time, as we know. Everything is changing. This is also very Buddhist, and that expressions they change, and also as we talked about. Uh, Buddhism can be explained in many languages, mm -hmm. and uh, and you could say that historically, as we also talked about, uh, that the thinking of Mahayana Buddhism you could see as a reaction against earlier Buddhism, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then if you like, one, one likes. Uh, we have these stories that well, this teaching uh, people were not. Uh, major enough to understand them and then they found them later uh, nagarjuna he went to the kingdom of the nagas to get clay to build all the hundred and eight thousand stupas he was ordered to make because he has broken the vinaya rules and then he brought back the pranya paramita and this is a tradition in buddhism that takes the pair 
Uh, and of course, uh, as scholars, we will say these are just written. They are they are editions. They are new editions yeah. of of, uh, of ongoing going philosophical uh, uh, philosophical discussions. Mm -hmm. On the other side, uh, Buddhists will say that well, this is the this is the true word of the Buddha. So why is it different? Mm -hmm. uh, but then, uh, of course. Uh, there are many answers to it, but the best one answer is that you have to find out what is true Buddhism yourself through reading, and this is ample. Uh, so nobody, <clears throat> this of course, also criticism of Mahayana Buddhism for the uh, older Buddhism or the Theravada or what we call it, mm -hmm. uh, they call them Shravakas. <laughs> And Shravaka means a listener. Yeah. There are people who need to listen to. But Mahayana says that the Bodhisattva is Ekai Ayana Marga. He's on his own road alone. Mm -hmm. So these are very difficult questions, but we could discuss for a long time. But I think it is, uh, it is uh, well, I tried. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, there's so many different ways. It's it's kind of the type of question of who, it depends on who you ask, right? Who are you asking and from what perspective are, are you asking that question about the authenticity of the Mahayana? And how does the, are you asking how the tradition takes it? Are you asking for a very strict kind of historical interpretation, right? But at the end of the day, what remains is the fact that ideas just don't remain static, I think, right? Yeah. Like intellectual discourse and dialogue, it just is not static and ideas build on each other. They they change, they um, become, you know, the discourse we know today. And like you said, at the end of the day, everyone has to decide for themselves what they think about such things. So, yeah. And we should do so. that. We should do that, decide yeah. for our, I think. Yeah, and this is, uh, I think, part of Mahayana Buddhism. Yes, strongly. I think I think so too. I think you gave us two pearls, many pearls of wisdom, but two takeaways. One, just wait a moment, and two, <laughs> you have to decide for yourself. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you so sense. much, Professor Borvik. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope that. You enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Yes, for it was my with... great pleasure, and it was my great pleasure. And I will say again, I'm very grateful to the eighty four thousand project. It helped me a lot, and I'm very glad to have been able to contribute. Also, to talking with you. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, eighty four thousand is very grateful to you for the work that you've done and for speaking with us today. Um, and to everyone who is online uh, listening, thank you so much for participating today. Um, we hope you learned a lot from Professor Brodvik, and we hope that you go and check out the text, The Collected Teachings of the Bodhisattva on the 84,000 online reading room. Um, and so that is it for today. Please sign up for the 84,000 newsletter if you would like to have updates on more events like this in the future. And in the meantime, please take care and um have um a good day everybody or a good night wherever you may be thank you again professor brodvik thank you so much thank you